Well, the last several days we were traveling along the coast of um, Egypt and Sudan, which um, is known also as Nubia, so I wanted to, this is relevant to the geography, but I think it's also important for us to remember, as we here are on our very comfortable ship, going by very exotic, hard to get to places, what it used to be like to try to get to some of these places. Hence this uh, talk on the 1905, 1907 expedition to Nubia at the University of Chicago. Now, in the, uh, at the transition of the 20th century, from the 19th century, there was a lot more interest in scientific missions to Egypt. And uh, one which had tremendous impact upon the documentation of Egypt is this, the University of Chicago expedition, 1905-1907. And this was really following along a long tradition of documentation of Egyptian monuments. This begins technically, although it certainly goes back further than this, with the Napoleonic expeditions in Egypt that culminated with the, uh, here's Napoleon himself of course, with the publication of the Monumental Description d'Egypte, which was published between 1809 and 1813. Very, very important set of publications in these mammoth folios um, very careful copies were made of hieroglyphs and of monuments. It was really this sort of documentation that made it possible to decipher hieroglyphs because it, it provided enough examples of accurately done signs. This uh, was followed by the great Prussian expedition, uh, Richard Lepsius, uh, in, uh, in shortly afterward, and his not always so fabulously accurate copies, but very, very important work as well. In fact, the Prussians really were the leaders in Egyptology, in early Egyptology, although French were early in, it was really the Prussians that were the masters of it. Then we have the um, invention of photography in 1838, but we continue to have these wonderful artistic views of Egypt. This, of course, is David Roberts, who we've encountered in some other different contexts here in his uh, native garb, very romantic, with his fabulous watercolor of uh, the Ramesseum in Luxor. So with the invention of photography in 1838 by Daguerre, if you remember the word daguerreotype, photographers began their documentation of Egypt. From the very beginning, people recognized how important photography was for documenting Egypt. So we have very early photographers. This is uh, the first photograph ever taken in Africa of the harem in Alexandria. It doesn't look like a photograph because for reproduction, of course, what they did, you can, at that point in photography, you get one copy. You cannot duplicate the images. And so this was then made into an engraving and published. So the early photographs, once they're published, look like engravings because of the fact they had to be reproduced through photo engraving techniques. And then in the uh, mid 19th century, a huge number of photographers were working in Egypt. These very important photographs taken as the monuments were being cleared. Francis Firth, of course, uh, British, 1856 to 1860, three big expeditions, and um, became very, very popular. If you remember before, you know, before radio and TV, people used to go to lectures, which are like you're doing now. But also a very, very popular form of entertainment, of course, was the stereoscopic card sets. And so the Middle East was a popular, very popular subject of stereoscopic cards. And every well-equipped household had a set of these cards of some of various topics in their parlor. And this was, you know, ooh, this is big entertainment. And this, of course, is how people saw the rest of the world, because this is before people had the ability and leisure to really travel. Um, the late years of the 19th century was a period of tremendous optimism in America. And a thing that's so, I think, really iconic of this is, of course, the Chicago World's Fair in 1893. It was supposed to commemorate um, Columbus, but Chicago was a little bit late. So instead of, for, in, uh, instead of 1892, it was 1893. And uh, Chicago dazzled the world with what was called the White City and introduced things like Cracker Jacks and a lot of very important innovations. <laughs> uh, but there was a lot of sort of quasi-anthropological educational attractions. Um, on the Midway. In fact, the Midway is a major street that I cross every day when I go to work. And of course, now Midway is a term for any kind of, you know, honky tonk. But the original Midway was in Chicago, and one of the really prime attractions on the Midway for this fair was Street in Cairo, which was a reproduction of uh, of Luxor Temple, 
and they had belly dancers, all these sorts of things. In fact, the Egyptians were very unhappy about the belly dancing. It was, it was um, little Egypt, it was, that's where she was first invented, was Street to Cairo. The Egyptians were really not happy about this. They thought it was very tawdry and, and vulgar. But the point being that Egypt was a huge sensation. People were really, really interested in Egypt. So we have things like the Cairo Street Waltz, all sorts of music, different types of souvenirs from that. Well, if you go about a block and a half away from the Midway, we have the beginning of the University of Chicago, which was founded there in 1892. The first president of the University of Chicago was William Rainey Harper, who was hired away from Yale. Um, he was a biblical scholar, and he was hired by John D. Rockefeller Sr., who funded the first University of Chicago. Actually, it's the second University of Chicago, because the first University of Chicago went broke. And so, Rainey, uh, William Rainey Parker sets out to hire the very best. And among his graduate students he had at Yale was a man named James Henry Breasted. And Breasted had a degree in pharmacy, very practical calling, like most people. His family was very concerned about him having a real living, so he studied pharmacy. But then he got, was attracted to the divinity. So he went to the Chicago Theological Seminary and then followed Parker to Yale to continue his studies. Harper promised him, after Harper had the job at the University of Chicago, he promised Breasted, Breasted, if you go to Germany and get the best sci possible scientific equipment, which means education, no matter if it takes you five years, I will give you the professorship of Egyptian at the new University of Chicago. And so here we have James Henry Breasted. He goes off to Germany in 1892. Here's Breasted, young Breasted, these photographs are just so great. Here's Breasted with the, with the absolute giants of Egyptology at this time. And Breasted's son, Charles, who is forever doomed to be wearing Goldilocks hairstyles and sailor suits. <laughs> uh, uh, Charles later became his father's biographer and his personal secretary. It's kind of a bittersweet story. But in any case, so Breasted goes to Germany and gets his degree on the hymns of Akhenaten on the uh, so-called monotheistic texts of Akhenaten. His dissertation, of course, as customary at that time, was written in Latin. Wow. So he comes back to Chicago in 1894 and takes up his position at the new University of Chicago. Now, the years of study had made a great impression on him. He had noted that translations of basic texts that were being used to write the history of Egypt were being made from inaccurate copies of the original texts. And he first noticed this in Divinity School because he was reading the Greek and Hebrew versions of the Bible and then comparing them to the King James Version. And this is when he was going to be in divinity rather than Egyptology. And he, he went to his mother, who had great hopes of having a minister in the family, and he told her, I cannot possibly preach on the basis of these texts because they are corrupt. They are not accurate because they're not accurate translations. That's what made him turn into Egyptology. And that was a real aha moment for him because he realized Accurate texts create accurate history, but junk in is junk out. And so very, this became his big mission, was to make accurate copies of texts, to make accurate translations, and hence to make accurate histories. Um, his enthusiasm for making accurate copies of texts in the Nile Valley is indicated by this text. In 1896, I had definitely launched upon one of the most arduous undertakings of my life, a plan for which it has steadily been growing in my mind since my Berlin student days. I began the task of collecting all the historical sources of ancient Egypt from the earliest times to the Persian conquest, wherever they existed in the world of translating them into English, and of creating, the, creating thereby, for the first time, a solid foundation for documentary source material for, for the production of the modern history of Egypt. This is like an impossible task. This guy makes no small plans. He's going to copy every historical inscription there is about Egypt and translate it. And he goes on to say, before I write a history based on the original monuments, I intend to find out to the last jot and tittle what the monuments say this is what the other fellows have not yet done. And so this was his real life mission. So this incredibly ambitious goal took him all over Europe initially. He was working for the great Berlin Dictionary Project, uh, the uh, 
the hieroglyphic dictionary was written in Berlin. It's, it's the one we still use. It's hieroglyphs into German. And here we have these wonderful copy books that Breston was using when he went to different museums, making hand copies of the inscriptions on these statues, so very meticulous hand copies. Traditionally, um, the inscriptions were copied by hand, but Breston was also an innovator, an adapter of new technology. He recounts using cameras. The methods at present prevailing are far too slow. I believe the solution to the problem is to be found in the large camera, which besides being far more speedy and more accurate than the draftsman, at the same time also furnishes a record more complete in that it fully preserves the plastic character, character of each sculpted figure or sign on the wall. A photograph, however, represents but one illumination of the wall, whereas it may be illuminated from many different directions successively, each different illumination bringing out lines not visible before. Furthermore, the eye of the trained epigrapher, epigrapher is somebody who studies inscriptions, for more, for, furthermore, the eye of the trained epigrapher who can read the inscription and understand the broken connection can discover more in the lacuna than the, than the lens of the camera can ever carry to the plate. So he was an early adopter of using photography. And what we'd say, well, this is really great. You know, this speeds it all up. It does speed it up, but you have to remember the limitations of photography at this point. This is the camera that he carried around Europe. It had something like 12 film holders. Each film holder can take two pieces of film. So he would load this up in a dark bag at his hotel room, go to the museum. He could take 24 photographs. And he had to go back to the hotel room develop all this in a black bag and start all over again. So it was quicker, but it's not, you know, it's not the land of digital photography yet. <laughs> the copies of texts that he translated, copied it and translated in Europe formed the, ba the basis of one of the most important histories of Egypt ever written. It's called The History of Egypt by Breston. It went through a lot of different editions. It was published in about eight or nine different languages, including Braille. <laughs> And it still reads amazingly well. You know, there are parts of it are, that are obsolete, but it is still often said to be one of the best histories of Egypt ever written. <laughs> so uh, he was then invited to sail for Europe to copy more inscriptions in 1899. And so he and his wife, Francis, and their son, Charles, sailed off. And according to Charles, who later wrote, now began a strange odyssey in quest of every accident that fragment of Egyptian history. When my father had taken photographs and made pen and ink copies of every ancient Egyptian relic in Europe, bearing so much as a lone hieroglyph of historic import. So he made a very, very meticulous work. With this sort of background and experience and rested successful track record in publishing, it's not surprising that he was able to get further support for this project of creating an accurate history of Egypt from the University of Chicago. And this came in the form of this expedition to Nubia that I want to tell you about from 1905 to 1906, a second season in 1906-1907. The goal of the expedition, according to Breasted, was the publication of all the monuments, tombs, and buildings of ancient Thebes, initially. Uh, and then it was expanded. The original budget was $7,000 a year for three years. So in November 1905, they set off. We have thousands of, literally thousands, fabulous photographs from this expedition. Breasted is in the middle. Charles in his sailor suit is, oops, is off to the side. There's Charles. And so it was a small expedition. It was Breasted, a photographer, and another epigrapher. And Mrs. Breasted was along. Mrs. Breasted was along because um, Breasted's doctor forbid him from traveling unless he had a doctor. And so I said, oh, man, I can't afford a doctor, but I'll bring my wife. And, it, <laughs> and this was like a huge military maneuver because, first of all, Breston had never, he'd been to Egypt once before on his honeymoon. So he's going into completely uncharted territory for him. And this was a very complicated maneuver because he had to do food depots. There was no place to buy anything in those areas of Egypt at the time. So over 100 wooden packing crates were, uh, were spotted through Egypt. And so they start, uh, here's the family. In, at the Orient Institute, we refer to this photograph as the Holy Family. <laughs> and so Breasted and his wife, and of course, Charles. So they start 
so they, they start off, uh, they take a train, and then they go up into this area and start heading south. In November and December, they spent assembling supplies, and such as water, camping equipment, photo supplies, stationary, medical supplies, a few revolvers and rifles. And remember the photographic equipment this time, they're using very large wood box cameras with 8x10 glass plate negatives. They're having to carry all of this up the Nile with them. So they took a train to Luxor onto Aswan where they rented an 80-foot Dahabea, this boat. We saw a boat similar to this in Luxor. And on Christmas Day, 1905 set out to the south, as recounted by uh, Breasted, said that there were hundreds of boxes, cases, bales, our decks and cabin rooms are piled with supplies of all sorts. And here, in fact, we have a little plan of the sailboat with, um, so the, uh, the two different, the photographer and the uh, epigrapher, the salon, so it was just chock-a-block with all sorts of things. But it was not necessarily Spartan. Charles later wrote, my father now entered another period of scientific drudgery as a self-appointed task, the importance of which he knew would be recognized by scarcely a dozen men in the entire scientific world. As for the general public, the meticulous recording of long known, steadily perishing, and largely unpublished historical monuments above ground had about it almost none of the excitement and fascination popular, popularly associated with digging for buried treasure. But he was more than ever convinced that however much the excavations of men like Petrie, Davis, Quibell, and others might contribute to Egyptology, he himself could render it no greater service than to copy, while they were still legible, records on the ancient monuments of Egypt. The work of this expedition was absolutely grueling. They, uh, they recount howling sandstorms that drove dust and grit into everything. The emulsion on the photographic plates is described as resembling emery paper. They uh, describe clouds of gnats descending as thick as tar smoke upon them. There are occasionally scorpions and tarantulas would drop onto the desks from overhanging trees when they moored. And they, re they recall roving swarms of ugly, vicious rats that would overrun their boat. Er uh, in certain areas, the temperature reached 140 degrees. And uh, in the memoirs, they write, the men would work for days at a stretch in the suffocating blackness of the inner chambers of rock-hewn tombs or in windowless storage rooms of temples, where the air, which has never been changed, was not merely hot, but stank unspeakably from untold generations of bats hanging in regiments from fouled ceilings. Pretty bad stuff. For, like, for a world used to digital photography, you have to remember what this was like. This is the sort of photographic equipment they're using. And in this process, they were very, very careful. It was very painstaking. So the large box camera with the 8x10 glass plate negative, they would make sure that the film plane was exactly parallel to the wall to avoid, avoid any distortion. Um, and also, so they would take the photograph, and then before they moved the camera, they would take the plate down to the Nile and develop it to make sure they had a usable picture before they moved the camera. So as you can imagine, this took a very long time. There were often very awkward positions to getting shots. For example, here a scaffolding they had to build. This is outside of Abu Simbel. Here from the top of the mast, hoisting these big cameras up. Or here at Temple of Sola, here's breasted on top of the, of the monument. The lighting, they usually used time exposures. They often worked in candlelight, which they wrote the bats would extinguish with the beating of their wings. Or occasionally they used magnesium flash. But it was a very, very complicated sort of work. Reflectors were good for varying the light sources to read eroded inscriptions. And in fact, even today, our epigraphers carry little, little mirrors. Now, an important part of this process was Breasted developed a system of cross-checking. So in this system, which is called the Chicago Method, they would take a photograph, which is shown here on the left. And then the thing that is absolutely crucial is that Breasted would take that photograph back to the original wall. And he would do a system called collation. So he would check every part of the photograph against the original wall. Because sometimes the human eye can see things that is not captured on the photographic plate. And that's what you see on the right side of this. Oops. He's, um, he's making, making emendations in the photograph to reflect what's actually on the wall. And this is the way of making the most accurate copy to go back 
with the photograph, compare it to the wall, and using the power of the human eye and also the knowledge of somebody who can actually read Egyptian to make a perfect copy. They worked at Abu Simbel for 40 days. It was the first documentation of this monument. This is a pretty great photograph. Here's Mrs. Breasted in her, in her big skirt and straw boater hat. Here's Charles. And here they're measuring the uh, face of the colossal statue of Ramses II at, at Abu Simbel. They did incredible photography of the inside and the outside of the temple. This is the interior of the temple of Ramses II. They spent 14 days alone copying some of the inscriptions on the outside of the temple. This is, of course, one of these wonderful photographs showing it before it was moved. Actually, this photograph is reversed. Now, I realize, although our, our label is there, this, should, this is actually backward. So at the end of the first season, they were satisfied they copied all the pre-Ptolemaic temples of Lower Nubia. The other epigrapher on the expedition had been in bad health throughout the trip, and apparently completely broke down at the end of the season, so they had to get back to Aswan for, for treatment. So the next season they went was October 1906 to March 1907, and this they started further south in Sudanese Nubia, rather than Egyptian Nubia, where they were working before. And it's maybe telling that neither of the other members of the team came back for the second season. <laughs> okay, it started with a whole new team. Um, there was a photographer, his name is Horst Schliepack, who was a photographer for the German military expedition to Peking. He's described in Breston's diary as the life of the party. And then the other member of the team was Norman de Gares Davis, a British artist, very important in the history of Egyptology. He and his wife were responsible for making the most beautiful facsimile paintings of scenes in tombs in Egypt. Very, very important person. This was almost like a military invasion. They, were, they really had a better sense of how to do this. So again, they had done food drops along the Nile. They left Cairo by ship with 30 boxes of supplies, and they sailed to Aswan. So they're taking the ship again up this way, and then they get on the Nile. At, As at Aswan. <coughs> His, uh, in Breasted's diary, he writes, my room is over the boiler of the shaky old flat bottom stern bueller, and the floor is almost too hot to hold your hand on it. We all wear pajamas, have our mattresses carried to the upper deck where we sleep until the flies begin to crawl into our eyes, ears, and nose. And it's interesting, at Wadi Halfa, which is fairly far south, they ran into another Chicagoan actually lived near the University of Chicago, who helped them with some of their logistics. About 230 miles further south, their crews, their supply and crew were, quote, hastily thrown from the train at the little wayside station at Kababesh. And he writes, as the train pulled out and moved away across the desert, we were left to the silence of the night and dreams of the ancient capital of Nubia, the mysterious Meroway of the Greeks, the pyramids of which we have described from the train as we passed, which we could still discern rising dimly on the northern horizon as the night fell. Most people are, are unaware that there are more pyramids in Nubia, in, in Sudan, than there are in Egypt. This is a, the royal burial field at Meroe, by Berea. So they spent the night in tents at the station when we were awakened the next morning. When the 14 camels they had ordered arrived, this is where we get the camels to cartoon part, they, um, and again, Poor Mrs. Breston, look at the clothing. It's just unbelievable. It's, you know, and here's, you know, sailor suit, gotta make sure. And the men, of course, are, are you know, formally dressed as they should be. So it's such a different way of traveling. So they uh, rode two hour, hours to Meroway, and where they, stayed, where they stayed in some of the pyramid chapels. Breston wrote, Breston wrote in his diary, I wake up every morning with a fat Ethiopian monarch some relative of Queen Candace, whose capital place this was, looking benignly down on me as he waves the palm branch he's been holding for some 2,000 years. <laughs> they moved on to Naga, uh, where the temperatures were in the range of 100 to 140 degrees. Uh, he wrote that working at the wall made their eyes swell from the glare. They had no permission to excavate. They, this was an epigraphic mission, so they were only copying inscriptions. Uh, and here's a, a oddly sort of colonial, but beautiful photograph of breasted copying inscriptions. There were a lot of challenges for the photographer. The uh, photographer, the water was brought from the river in sheepskins that were so full of mud they had to boil it. 
to be able to develop their film. They developed the negatives in the sun, computing the time, and several times lost an entire day's work because of these calculations. They continued on to Naga from Meroway. Here's one of the, the uh, tombs at Meroway with the little chapel in front of it. More views. These views are very, very commonly requested by publishers. Um, we, these are carried in a lot of different publications because this does not look like it does anymore. And to Naga, this beautiful Roman era uh, Egyptian style temple, and here this wonderful kind of mashup of Roman and traditional Egyptian architecture. These are contemporary structures. The, this whole history of Nubia is very interesting because the Nubians became very Egyptianized and then they also were very adapted to, to Roman. So you have this fascinating hybrid culture in this area. They continued on uh, that's not such a good plan, to uh, at one place, they almost lost everything in the Nile. They were traveling in small boats, and uh, all the negatives almost fell into the Nile and were destroyed. <coughs> Once uh, further south, Mrs. Breston and Charles joined them. So they initially stayed in Egypt and then joined the group later. It seems that the other gentlemen of the party were not really happy to have Mrs. Breston and Charles along. Um, they were described, the other, the photographer and the other epigrapher were described as militantly independent bachelors who resented the inhibiting presence of a woman and a ubiquitous small boy, especially when Mrs. Breston was made expedition housekeeper. Gradually, the tension bred by sandstorms, personal idiosyncrasies, and unpredictable minor crises of expedition life increased until it flared and crackled, as Breston put it, like an overcharged Leiden jar. So not exactly the best atmosphere. They continued to travel northward, shooting birds for food, copying inscriptions, uh, taking more photographs. This is at Tombos. Crossing the third cataract, they almost wrecked the boat. At one point, water was pouring into the, into the hold that contained all the negatives. Uh, but members of the British survey team happened to be there and, and helped them out in that case. Well, what is the legacy of this expedition? Part of the legacy is the photographs. This is extremely important. Let me go back to this. Because today, here's the high dam at Aswan. This is north, of course. And after the high dam was built, all of this was flooded. This is now called Lake Nasser. And this is an area that Breasted did a lot of photography through. Most of these monuments are now under several hundred feet of water. Do you remember in the 60s, a few of these temples were saved. They were cut up and moved higher. For example, Abu Simbel, a few temples were actually Move, for example, the Temple of Dendur at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which was a gift to the United States from Egypt. But the, the loss of information in this area is just astounding since the High Dam. And so the photographs that Breasted took are incredibly important documents of these areas which just no longer exist at all. For example, here at Ger Hussein Temple, just it, there are a few pillars left of it. This is the only sort of documentation we have of it. Here at Ger Hussein again. Amada Temple, this, this one was actually carved up, put on railroad tracks and, and moved. Or of course Abu Simbel that it was, was also moved and Breasted's documentation is the most complete documentation we have of before it was moved. Or places like uh, Maharata. Uh, this, this temple, which in Breasted's photograph shows the state of it at the time. If you go to it today, it's been restored. So these photographs are consulted by publishers and archaeologists and epigraphers throughout the world. And the original glass plate negatives are still ha housed in our archive in Chicago. Now, Breston envisioned that this study he did of the monuments of Nubia would be published in 16 folio volumes. He always thought big. It's kind of ironic that they were ultimately published in microfiche, sort of the, the, the ultimate downsizing. The photographs from this expedition are all available online. If you Google Oriental Institute and Nubia, you can get all of these photographs. After the expedition, the personnel, the first expedition, the first season, Victor Persons, um, he of the ill health, had to go to, to uh, Aswan. He had a very distinguished career after this. He went on to become an archaeologist in Babylonia, 
working for the University of Chicago in a site called Bismaya, and then afterward he sort of slipped into obscurity. The photographer of that expedition, Friedrich Koch, he was 33 at the time he was with the University of Chicago expedition. And he went on to have a very, very distinguished career. In 1908, he worked with the Prussian expedition at Philae, here's Philae right here, where he took more than 2,000 photographs. It's sort of the Prussian, Prussian expedition's version of the University of Chicago expedition. Um, he went on to work at uh, Tura, many, many different places, and at Giza, these wonderful old photographs. So here's the Prussian expedition at Giza working, and there's Friedrich Koch, the photographer who's now working with Hermann, Hermann Juncker, the great excavator of the Giza Plateau. The second year crew, the photographer, his name is Horst Schliepach, and he was actually fired from the expedition. This is kind of an interesting story. He was fired from the expedition when Bresta discovered he was carving his name on monuments <laughs> at Naga and Musawara. And this, Bresta realized how bad this was. And, but uh, Schliepeck, this is the second expedition where the whole atmosphere was pretty toxic. And uh, Schliepeck refused to be fired. Oh. And he seized most of the photographic equipment as, as basically a hostage against being fired. Um, there was a lawsuit. It, it eventually worked out, but not, not very good. And obviously, he never worked with Breston again. Now, the person who really has a career from this, as I mentioned, is Norman de Garris Davis, who's shown here. Before the expedition, he had already been acknowledged as a great as a great draftsman. In the early years of the century, he was known as Poor Davis to distinguish him from. Do you remember Theodore Davis? I mentioned who was the great excavator in the Valley of the Kings, the American magnate. So this is Poor Davis as opposed to Rich Rich Davis, <laughs> and he copied an astonishing quantity of beautifully. Uh, he, he and his wife were both copyists. This is an example of their work where they went into the to into the tombs and made beautiful, accurate facsimiles of these colored scenes. Very important, because these have not survived well at all over the years. So he worked in Thebes for many years, and um, the book that they did together called Ancient Egyptian Paintings and Two Elephant Folios was co-published by the University of Chicago in 1936. Um, wonderful, wonderful publication. It also is available online. Actually, all of our publications are, are available free online if you want to look at this one as well. Now, the details and valuable documentation of this expedition which really joins work with Napoleon, Lepsius, and others, but it's very distinctively American, but it's small scale and international staff. It set the model for the style of copying inscriptions and reliefs that is still used today at the Epigraphic Survey in Luxor. So this is Chicago House from the air. Uh, we have lost a lot of the yard over the years. We used to have complete access to the Cornish. Now our yard is about here since the most recent widening of the street in front of us. But this is our compound in Luxor when it was still fields around it. This is the uh, residence wing and this is the library and workshop wing. Uh, we most recently lost the badminton court. Boo hoo. Because <laughs> they widened this street behind us. So. Goodbye to the bed that you heard. But this is, again, a Breasted idea. Breasted believed that if you're going to have scientists in the Middle East, then they have to be dedicated to their work. And so Breasted was able, through the funding of John D. Rockefeller Jr., to establish a whole series of these compounds through the Middle East. This is the biggest one and the most enduring. We had a, a major field mission at um, uh, outside of Baghdad. We have one in, uh, at Persepolis, which is no longer being used, and also in Megiddo in Palestine. So there were all of these University of Chicago outposts, but this is the one that still exists. And so six months of the year, we have about 12 of our staff out there working and copying inscriptions doing it exactly the way Preston had envisioned it. So this starts, here are two of our epigraphers, Mark Margaret Dijon and uh, Brett McLean, working in the small temple at Medina Habu. It starts with a photograph, just as it did before. For example, here's a scene from the Luxor Temple, giving you a good example of why epigraphy is important. Because you look at this photograph, and there's so much visual noise in it because of the damage. There's a lot of salt damage. There are pieces missing. It's very hard to figure out, OK, you can see a boat, but what else is going on? So the important thing is this is photographed. And then the photograph is penciled, one of the artists traces over the photograph with everything that she or he can see, and then the photograph is bleached away to leave the line drawing. It's much easier to see because you've lost all that background noise. 
in the photograph. Then this blueprint is copied and it's cut up into eensy weensy little pieces. And this is taken by an epigrapher, three different epigraphers, three different times to the wall in this system of collation. So they take this scrap up to the wall, they compare it very, very carefully to what's actually on the wall, again using mirrors to change the lighting. And all of this stuff around here, these are comments. Things like wing should be so, or foot should move. So they're because it's very important that the hieroglyphs be absolutely accurately copied because often we can date inscriptions by the shape of the hieroglyphs. So it's important that it be as accurate as possible. So three different epigraphers take this to the wall and then the chief epigrapher, the field, field director, meets with them all. They have a consensus of what is actually on the wall. And then the artist, Margaret de Jean again, here, here she's um, penciling and in the process of comparing what's on the wall. And then when the consensus is made, the final drawing is done by entering what the epigraphers believe what was on the wall, they put it back on the original drawing. And then it is inked and published. So that is the final result. It's very, very time consuming and certainly we have been um, criticized for the amount of time it takes, but nobody has been able to devise a more accurate way of doing this. And there are a couple copies of the Chicago House Epigraphic Survey magazine here, the report. They are finally starting to work with uh, digital, but it still cannot replace the collation process that is so important, the human eye and, uh, and photography. So that is really the legacy of um, of James Henry Breasted. Really, when you're considering the modern science of epigraphy and the contributions of the Oriental Institute to the documentation of reliefs and inscriptions, you really have to remember it started over 100 years ago in a very simple but very effective way. So really, working under impossible conditions, Breasted and his expedition managed to make over 1,000 photographic negatives that are still valuable documents of little visited monuments. So, I have a couple minutes left. What I wanted to do is, I thought Ross's talk yesterday in World War II was very, very interesting. And I also want to remind you that 11 o'clock today, right after this lecture, there will be a remembrance service because it is 11-11. So do remember at 11 o'clock if you wish to join the remembrance service for World War I. So Breasted, who you see here, <coughs> later, right after World War I, decided it was a perfect time to go to the Middle East because uh, he, re he realized that nobody had been buying antiquities. At that time, it was legal to buy and export antiquities. So at that point, he had received a huge, huge amount of money from John D. Rockefeller Jr. to establish the Oriental Institute. And so Breasted decided this is the perfect time to go scout for areas to excavate and also to buy antiquities for the museum. And his reasoning was, the war is over. Um, it is Syria, Mesopotamia, Egypt are under European powers. They're under the mandate system, and so it's a safe time to go. Boy, was he wrong. Really, really wrong. So he set off on this incredibly goofy expedition from 1919 to 1920. Here's Breasted, as a much older man, of course, two graduate students and two colleagues. So they sail for the Middle East. And what do they find? They find the Middle East in flames. Because what's happening is, as Ross was saying, uh, the Arabs had been, grant, had been promised their own homeland. They're not getting it. What they have are the French occupying what became Syria and Lebanon, and the British in Egypt and Mesopotamia, and sort of Transjordan under the Hashemites. And so what Breston is seeing is this absolute mayhem as he's trying to travel around doing scholarly work. For example, the RAF was bombing the tribes in Mesopotamia. There were uh, we have pictures of the armored Rolls-Royce tanks that were in Mesopotamia. It was just completely insane. And Breston was like, hi, we're here to study the antiquities. <laughs> so they're constantly running into, into the British forces. In fact, they had to appeal to the British forces for protection because a big problem was the Arabs were, there were constant assassinations, especially in, in Egypt. Um, there were assassinations of British generals all over the place. 
and throughout uh, Mesopotamia, it was also a very, very dangerous time for people to be there. And so, of course, Breasted was like trying to figure out how he's going to do this. He puts himself under the protection of the British because he has to. They won't let him travel without that. And so they're traveling around in just these incredibly difficult ways. For example, here is his Arabea, this set of these terrible little carts that they're bumping across Mesopotamia in. In certain periods, they have a whole fleet of Model A, or maybe Model T, which only one it would be in 1919, 1920. But the thing that I found so charming about this is notice the American flag. It's on a little sort of crooked stick because they're saying, we're Americans, don't shoot. We're not British, we're not French, we're American. <laughs> and of course, here we have it again with our little American flag. And the American flag is weird. It's an old flag at the time. We don't know where they got it. And this is incredible because here's our founder with a pistol. It's like, oh, wow. And of course, because we are an archive, we don't throw anything away. Here's the original flag that they dragged across the Middle East. And uh, breasted, again, sometimes you got the idea of, um, he was so single-minded that maybe he was just not thinking about what was actually going on around him. So he meets with Faisal. This was um, King Faisal, who was then in Damascus. And as Ross was saying, he was in Damascus and then gets kicked out and becomes king of Iraq. This is about a day and a half before the French kick him out of Damascus. And Breasted is there to like, have tea with Faisal. And it's like, Faisal obviously has other stuff on his mind. But at least Breasted does come away with a signed portrait of Faisal. So crazy, crazy times. More on Breasted. Uh, the stories with Breasted are absolutely fascinating. Um, the book written by his son is called Pioneer to the Past. It's a great read. It's really, really interesting. And then uh, I worked on this project with Jeff Amberling, Pioneers to the Past, American Archaeologists in the Middle East, 1919-1920. This is, I think this is interesting if you're just in archaeology and in World War I, because it's about the political situation and how politics and archaeology were working together in this period. Both of those, like all of the publications of the University of Chicago, are available for a free PDF download. You can just Google Oriental Institute and whatever, and it's all of our publications are available for free. One that is not free, but is really good. If you're really interested in Breasted, because it has everything about Breasted, is a fairly recent book by Jeffrey App called American Egyptologist James Henry Breasted and the Institute he founded. I think it's like 2012 or something like that. But thank you very much. That was not supposed to sound really like a big ad for the University of Chicago, but it's, it's an important part of the story right there. Any questions? Yeah, Chris. When you look at um, the hieroglyphics, is it, do they change at all? Is there like a handwriting, or are they absolutely consistent? Are the hieroglyphs uh, consistent, or are there different types of handwriting? Yes, there's a lot of uh, there are a lot of different hands, you might say. So, for example. Um, when writing very formal hieroglyphs, they should be kind of standard. But for example, one artist will make the uh, the eye on the on the rabbit a little different shape, and maybe the ear will be a little bit different. It's important to be very consistent, and they were because, for example, there's something like 65 different birds used in hieroglyphs, and if you do the wrong tail, you know, it turns into a different sign. It's a typo. You know, it, it changes the whole word. But there also is so there's the formal hieroglyphs, but then when they wanted to write things more rapidly they would use a cursive form of hieroglyphs called hieratic, and there's a huge, much more variation in the handwriting of that where we can actually match up scribes, like, you know, that hand, and also it changes over time, just like you think about people's handwriting 100 years ago to today, God help us, most of us, um, and so, yes, we, it's called orthography or paleography, so we can date inscriptions by the style of the, of the handwriting. Hmm. Yeah. There, there looks like literally acres of walls with inscriptions on them. So how would they how would they choose where to spend this enormous amount of time? Here versus there versus somewhere else? Good question. There it's looks like there are acres and acres of walls with hieroglyphs on them. How did they decide where to start? With the Breasted expedition, he was focusing on historical inscriptions. And so he could he could scan the walls and figure out which one were were religious inscriptions and he'd leave those away, uh, leave those alone and go to the historical inscriptions. And really, with a lot of this material he's working with in, in Nubia, 
there are not that many historical inscriptions. I mean, there's a lot, but it's, so he was, I don't, it, it's a very good question. He doesn't really say, he must have, when they get to a site, he must have walked the site and said, okay, we're gonna work here, 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 and here. It's like the recent work of the University of Chicago. They said in the 1920s when they started the Luxor, it's like, okay, we're gonna do this temple, we're gonna do this temple. So you, you pick and choose. But I think with Breasted, he would do a survey and figure out exactly how much they had to do it at that particular site. And I don't recall him actually saying how he's doing that. Yes? When did Nubia become part of the Nubia? When did Nubia become part of Egypt? Uh, uh, the question is about, about, I think, um, the question is about Nubia as an entity, as a geographic entity. Nubia is, is really an ethnic group and a place, it's not a state. So the Nubian people uh, bridge the area between southern Egypt and northern Sudan. So it's, ne it's never actually been a state. It's always been split between Egypt and whatever at that point was south, south of Egypt. There is a Nubian language, an old Nubian language and a, and a modern Nubian language. And so there are people, people who are live, Egyptians who live in southern Egypt who will very proudly proclaim themselves as Nubians. They are Egyptians, but they are Nubians. Does that answer your question? Sir? The question is, how have recent political events in Egypt affect the work of the University of Chicago? Luxor has been really, really not affected very much at all. At the very beginning of the revolution, one of the town halls was torch, something like that, but there's been very little anything, which is one of the reasons why people in Cairo think the people in Luxor are such hicks, because it, there's really not much that goes on in Luxor. So our, our um, our operations have been pretty much unaffected. At the beginning, we weren't sure, and so we took the big brass plates off the off the front gates and said University of Chicago. We just took them off for a while, and they're back now because there's really nothing going on in Luxor. So it depends. So we are relatively unaffected. However, groups that are working in Middle Egypt, groups that are working at Giza, were affected. It was there was more unrest in those areas. The biggest problem after the revolution was that the ministries were not functioning. And each year before any excavators go out, they have to have their permits signed, they have to have all the regulations, all, all the permits signed. And those committees were not meeting because they weren't appointing the people to the committees. That was the biggest problem. Um, so there have been some areas, but the first year of the revolution, there were a number of expeditions in Middle Egypt that were evacuated. And this was very interesting because it's never really happened before. And it wasn't so much that there was danger, but the problem is there were graduate students on the expeditions, and the universities could not take any chances with the students. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, although the expedition leader said, it was fine, there was nothing going on, they had no choice, because the university said, get out. So it has not had a tremendously bad, it, it hasn't had a lot of impact. The question is about a man named Zaki Awas, who was the director of the Antiquities Organization, and he was always on TV, the guy with the hat, you know, and constantly everywhere, you know. Uh, he is no longer employed by the, by the government, and the guy was a pain, but he did a really, really good job. I mean, who, people knew who this guy was, and his job was to keep Egypt in the press, make people aware of Egypt, and he did. People. People knew who this guy was because he was such a, a, a grandstander. Um, he has a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, so he's, he's a trained Egyptologist. The biggest failing of Zaki Awas was um, mainly he did not promote younger people, that he kept, he really kept the prime slots for himself and his cronies, you might say. He was not corrupt. You can't make accusations, accusations of corruptness against him. But he just was not giving opportunities to younger Egyptologists. And Egypt has a lot of very talented young Egyptologists. So there have been a number of people in the position since since then. Zaki has recently said, 
I'm happy to come back. If you want me, I'll, I'll be there. And everybody's like, looking at their shoes. So he's still around. He's, he's leading tours. He's leading private tours. Maybe just one more. Yeah. What happened to the son Charles? What happened to the son Charles? Charles Breasted. Um, as I mentioned to you, he was in Dad's shadow most of his life. At one point, he sort of broke away, and then his father said he really, really needed his help. And so Charles jettisoned any career he had on his own, be his father's secretary. And so he spent actually a lot of time in the Middle East on behalf of his father, and he also ran uh, the Chicago operation when his father was away. So he had a very interesting career. Um, his father, James Henry Breasted, died in 1935, and that really changed everything because that's when uh, the funding for Rockefeller really, really dried up. Uh, a sadder story is the other son, Charles's brother, James Henry Breasted Jr., bad career choice. He was going to become an Egyptologist. It's like, I don't think you want to become an Egyptologist when your father is the most famous Egyptologist in the world, your father's on the cover of Time magazine. He wrote one book and then just decided it wasn't going to work. He couldn't stand in the shadow. And he had a very distinguished career as a museum administrator. He was the director of LACMA, the LA County Museum, for many years. So thank you. Oh, one, one more question in the back. And I'm Do the African pharaohs come from Nubia? Uh, yes. And there is a whole Nubian dynasty called the 25th dynasty, which is really a period of renaissance. It's incredible, because the Nubians stepped in when Egypt had broken up into a bunch of quarreling dynasties, and they were being attacked from the north, and the Nubians came up and said, we are saving you. It is Amun who sent us, and they reunified Egypt. So those guys are definitely from Nubia. But before then, there were other people, there were other rulers that probably were, not, were Nubian of Nubian extraction, but the, the 25th dynasty, about about six uh, about 600, is from Nubia. They're actually from very far south. In fact, a lot of the kings didn't live in, in Egypt. They lived in Nubia and then sent their administrators north. So thank you very much. And again, a reminder: 11 o'clock. Remember, it serves.